Tatsumi is a dumb yet ambitious country boy who wants to make it big in the imperial capital, and he will do so one day by saving the nation with his skills and sacrifice. This all started one day when Tatsumi left his small and poor village alongside his two childhood best friends to go to the imperial capital and earn lots of money and help his people. On his way, Tatsumi encounters a first-class danger beast called Earth Dragon, who is attacking a couple of travelers. He jumps in like a hero and immediately cuts off one of the dragon's arms. After that, he jumps up and butchers the beast on his way down with his sword. The travelers commend his skills and then thank him for his help. After hearing his story, they warn him about the corruption running in the capital city, and they all walk away. After reaching the capital, Tatsumi heads to the military barracks and applies for a commanding position. Naturally, the recruiter offers to hire him as a grunt in the beginning, but Tatsumi refuses and gets kicked out of the establishment. Just then, a beautiful and bold-looking blondie walks up to him and tells him that she can help him get a government job if he treats her to a drink. Tatsumi accepts and they go to a bar. At the bar, after having her drinks, the girl says that she knows a government official and if she greases his palms with some money, he can help get Tatsumi in a commanding position given how strong he is. Hearing this, Tatsumi becomes really happy and hands over all the money he got for slaying the danger beast on his way to her. The girl says that she will go and take care of everything and that Tatsumi will surely learn a lot from this experience. After that, she simply walks off with his money, while Tatsumi waits the whole day at the bar like the simp he is. At night, the bar owner tells him that it's about closing time and that he has been scammed. Hearing this, Tatsumi becomes sad and then angrily walks out of the bar cursing the blonde girl. Now being broke, he decides to just sit down on the pavement and spend the night there. But just then, a carriage passes by and the lady within comes out and offers to help him. At first, Tatsumi is suspicious, but the guards tell him that Lady Area can't help looking at unfortunate people like him and often helps them like this. Having nothing to lose, Tatsumi accepts her generous offer and goes along with her. At her house, he meets her parents and finds out that they are really rich and owns a massive mansion. He makes introductions and tells them that on his way to the capital, his group was attacked by some bandits and he got separated from his friends. As they had all decided to meet in the capital anyways, he continued his journey and is now looking for them. Hearing his story, the father says that he will put a good word with his military acquaintance for Tatsumi and will also request the search for his two friends. Tatsumi feels really blessed and his hope in humanity starts to restore from his earlier experience. The next day, he accompanies Aria on one of her shopping trips and he gets to talk to the guards as well. One of the guards shows him the imperial palace and tells him that while the emperor is alive, he is only a child and the real ruler of the country is the prime minister who is really corrupt, and that's why the country is rotting right now. Tatsumi becomes mad about the whole situation and says that it's his fault that his poor village has to deal with such unbearable taxes. After that, the guard points him to a wall with some wanted posters of the members of Night Raid. He explains that they are a group of assassins that attack at night and only target high-ranking executives and the capital's upper-class people, so he should be on guard just in case. That night, we see the mother walking in the mansion and suddenly she gets sliced up by a massive pair of scissors held by a purple-haired girl. Tatsumi senses this murderous intent and gets out of his bed to see what's happening. He looks out the window and sees a bunch of people equipped with weapons and standing on some strings in the sky. He notes that they are the night raid and wonders why they are attacking such nice people only because they are rich. He then decides to rush to Arya's side and act as her bodyguard. He meets up outside his shelter deep in the woods and says that he will protect her. But just then, one of the assassins, Akam, arrives and she zooms past Tatsumi in a blink of an eye. She dashes straight towards the other guard and cuts him in half and then walks up to Arya. Tatsumi jumps in front of her making Akam fall back. She tells him that he is not her target but Tatsumi says that he won't let her kill Arya. Akame says that in that case, she has no other choice but to kill him too, and they both start clashing their swords. Tatsumi manages to match her for a couple of strikes, but then she swiftly stabs his heart, putting him down like an NPC. Meanwhile, we see the blondie from earlier arrive on the scene as well, and in looking at Tatsumi, she wonders just how unlucky can a guy be. But then Tatsumi gets back up and reveals that he was saved by the little idol he was keeping in his inner pocket that his villagers gave him. After that, Akame goes on for the finishing blow in his neck, but the blondie stops her and tells her that she owes the boy a favor and would like to pay it off. She tells Tatsumi that they don't kill innocent people and to prove it, she rips open the door of the shelter behind them to show the ugly reality of her target. Tatsumi walks in and finds out that it is actually a torture chamber with dead bodies hanging everywhere. But he becomes super depressed when he sees that the body hanging in the center is that of one of his friends, Seo. And just then, a boy calls out to Tatsumi, revealing himself to be Iyasu. With his dying breath, he tells him that Arya killed Seo by torturing her to death, and this makes Tatsumi really mad. 
With the cat out of the bag, Arya starts insulting Seo and the other dead people saying how she couldn't bear her being more beautiful and poor people are just her playthings and there's nothing wrong with what she wants to do with her toys. Akame decides to finish her off but suddenly Tatsui turns around and cuts Arya in half with his blade and then he rushes to Ayasu and lets him take his last breath in his arms. The blondie notes that Tatsumi didn't hesitate in killing Arya and thinks that he is actually really strong. She then tells Akame that he should join them and then drags him with her and makes him forcefully meet with the others and join the night raid. Akane reveals the blondie's name as Leon and then they all go back to their base after kidnapping Tatsumi and bring him along. The next day, Tatsumi sits by the graves of his two friends and wonders how he is now all alone. Just then, Leon arrives and asks if he has made his mind up about joining or not. She then takes him to meet the other members starting off with the purple-haired airhead called Sheil and asks her to tell him some words of encouragement. Sheil thinks about it a bit and then says that now that he knows about their hideout, if he doesn't join, they will have to kill him. Yeah, really encouraging. Next up, he gets to meet Mine who walks up to him and tells him that someone ugly like him can't work with professionals like them. After that, they go to the training ground where they meet the super masculine looking Bulat who normally wears his armor on the missions. Leon reveals that he's gay and Bulat doesn't deny it either. Next, they meet the perverted peeping Tom, Lubak, and then they head to the river to meet Akame. Leon reveals that despite her cute looks, she was raised in the wild and is really strong. Akame says that the boss and agenda is back and Tatsumi gets to introduce himself to her. She tells Leon to gather everyone and says that she wants a detailed report on the young man. After getting the report on him, Agenda offers Tatsumi to join their ranks and if he doesn't want to then he will be employed at their workshop, but he won't be killed nonetheless. Though with his skills he would be better off helping them as the intelligence gathering and assassination squad of the Revolutionary Army. Agenda reveals that they want to rid the nation of the corrupt leaders and will lead the Revolutionary Army to victory and save everyone including his village. Hearing this, Tatsui says that it means that they are heroic assassins and are on the side of good. Everyone starts laughing and tells him that they are plain murderers no matter how he likes to spin it. They kill people and can be sentenced to death anytime and no one would lift a finger. Regardless of that, Tatsumi thinks that it's the right thing to do and he accepts to join their group. After that, the boss assigns Akame to train him and they dismiss the meeting. At first, Tatsumi is only on kitchen duty and helps Akame catch fish and prepare meals for everyone, while the others go out on intelligence gathering assignments. One night, they all gather at the dinner table and Leon reveals that their targets this time are over of the Imperial Police and an oil merchant named Gamal. According to their report, Gamal commits crimes and bribes Ogre and Ogre pins his crimes to an innocent person and gets them executed. The Night Raid accepts this mission and Tatsumi is assigned to kill Ogre, while Akam and Leon will deal with Gamal. After that, they go to the city and Leon tells Tatsumi about Akam's past. She reveals that when she was a child, she and her sister were bought by the Empire. Then she was forced into assassin training alongside various other children and managed to emerge from them as the best amongst them. She was then used by the Empire to do their dirty work, but during her mission, she realized the corrupt nature of the Empire and on a mission to kill the boss. She managed to convince her to change sides and Akame has been on the side of the Revolutionary Army since. Tatsubi understands that she told him about Akame's past to tell him that he is too complacent with killing others and he should be more on guard. With that, they part ways and head out for their targets. Akam and Leon take care of the oil merchant easily while Tatsumi approaches the drunk ogre on the evening streets. He hides himself in a robe and tells the officer that he has something important to discuss with him, and he would like to talk in a place where there are no people. They go through a secluded alleyway and their Tatsumi bows down and asks him to enroll him in the Imperial Army. Ogre turns around and says that he should try his luck somewhere else but then notices Tatsumi's bloodlust who is about to strike him with his back turned, he quickly turns around but Tatsumi cuts him without giving him a chance to respond. With Ogre on the ground, Tatsumi thinks that he has succeeded and proceeds to walk away, but then Ogre stands up behind him and then starts attacking him relentlessly. He manages to push Tatsumi back to a wall and then says that he must be from the night raid. He starts badmouthing the group and Tatsumi jumps up and strikes back to shut him up. However, Ogre simply strikes back and contests him, while saying that it must be the widowed girl whose husband he sentenced to death and he will go and kill her right after finishing here. Hearing this, Tatsumi becomes really mad and he pushes through and cuts one of Ogre's arms. After that, he jumps up and butchers him down the same as he did with the Earth Dragon earlier on. With that, he goes back to the base and reports the successful completion of his mission to the boss. Akame checks him for injuries and says that she's glad that he returns safely. With this mission done, Nagenda assigns him to mine for his next training. The next day, their base is sniffed out by assassins from some other nation, and they all head out to deal with them. During this mission, Bulat shows Tatsumi his imperial relic in Curzio, 
which is the armor he wears alongside his spear. His armor gives him a lot of strength and agility while his spear can slice through enemies like butter. A king's relic is her sword, Murasane, which has the ability to curse people with a single cut which poisons them to death in seconds. Mine's relic is her energy gun called Pumpkin. She wields a pair of massive scissors called Extase that can block bullets and cut through anything. Lubak uses a glove and wire relic called Crosstail and Leon wears a belt-type relic that lets her transform into a cool cat girl and enhances all her senses and gives her superhuman strength, speed, and regeneration. And finally, our Tatsumi wields his old rusty sword that he brought from his village. It's just tutorial-level gear. After taking care of the assassins, Tatsumi begins his training with mine the next day. However, his training starts off with a couple of energy blasts from her relic and a shopping date throughout the day in the name of investigation. Tatsumi feels like it's a waste of time, but then Mine takes him to the public execution grounds, where he sees innocent people being hung and tortured to death due to the policies of the corrupt Prime Minister. The next day, they get their next mission, which is to kill a distant relative of the Prime Minister called Eduko. They all go to complete this mission as a team in Mine shoots down Eduko with her masterful sniping skills using her relic. Meanwhile, the rest of the Night Raid members deal with the guards and other men from his group. On their way back, Mine tells Tatsumi about her past and shares that she was born on the western border of the Empire and she is a half-foreigner. Due to this, she was always looked down upon as an outsider and was discriminated against. After the Revolutionary Army joined with the Westerners, she joined the Night Raid and now plans to open a path to their victory to create a country with no prejudice. And after all of that, she wants to get rich and live a comfortable life off her contribution in the war. After that, they head to the rendezvous point to meet up with others, but just then, they are ambushed by the leader of the guards. He's a specialized martial artist and he jumps on them by kicking Tatsuni aside and heading straight for Mine. Mine shoots back and keeps him off, but he manages to come close anyways. However, Tatsumi stops him by hugging him like Goku did to his brother and tells Mine to shoot him down and preferably not like Piccolo. Looking at him putting so much faith in her, Mine takes the shot and then agrees to accept him as a member of the Night Raid. A few days later, Tatsumi starts training his swordsmanship with Bulat at the base. He helps Akame in the kitchen and spends the rest of the day training to improve his skills. One night, the boss calls everyone to the meeting hall and tells them about their next target. This time around, they are to hunt down a serial killer who likes beheading people as a sport. They talk among each other and figure out that it must be Zank the executioner who went insane and became a murderer. The boss tells them that Zank stole an imperial relic before escaping, and so they all should keep their guards up on this mission. After that, they all go to the city and start patrolling the area. Tatsubi pairs up with Akam and they walk around for a bit. During their lunch break, he goes to the side to relieve himself and just then, he sees Seo at the end of the street. He tries to reach out to her, but she starts running away towards the Colosseum and he decides to chase after her. At the Colosseum, he walks up to her and hugs her calling out her name, but just then realizes that instead of his beautiful friend, he's actually clinging to a jacked up weirdo. Bulat must be jealous. Tatsumi jumps back and takes his sword out. The weirdo reveals himself to be Zank and starts reading Tatsumi's thoughts with the help of his imperial relic called Spected. At first, he only sees Bulat in them, but let's ignore that and get to the action. Tatsumi starts the fight by charging in with his sword, but Zank dodges it with ease because his observation Haki is too strong. Tatsumi tries to strike again, but Zank ducks down and slashes back with his hand blade. He tries to overwhelm Zank with a barrage of stabs, but Zank dodges everything and then strikes back similarly, slashing Tatsumi's joints and muscles, rendering him completely useless. After that, Tatsumi musters up all his strength and manages to nick Zank's face in return for having his back slashed. He then turns around and falls on the ground as the executioner walks forward to deal a finishing blow. But just then, Akame jumps in and stops him. Being an Anime villain, Zank takes off his cloak for completely no reason and then faces Akame with both his blades. Akame charges forward with her sword and they both start clashing their swords with great mastery. Akame notes that Zank is keeping up with her by reading her thoughts, so she clears her mind, and instead of becoming an idiot like Luffy, she actually manages to strike forward. But Zank blocks her still and slashes her back. He reveals that he can see the slightest movements in her muscles with his relic and can respond in time. He then uses his Jinjutsu to make Akame think of him as her sister Kurom. He says that now she must be seeing the person she loves the most and she won't be able to fight. He runs forward to hit her, but to his surprise, Akame strikes back with more force than ever and says that it is because she loved her she slashed back with all her force to end it quickly. Realizing that Akame is more of a maniac than himself, he loses his mind and unleashes a barrage of stabs at her like a noob. Akame parries them all and then ends the battle with a clean strike at his throat. After finishing their mission, they all go back home and the next day, Tatsumi wakes up under the Kara shield. 
They begin her training by making him swim in the river while wearing heavy armor. After a few rounds, he comes up and talks to Sheila and she tells him that he did a good job, and it is important for all assassins in the group to be able to carry their own weight. After that, Tatsumi asks her what her job was on the team and she says that being an airhead, she always messed up whatever she tried to do and so she doesn't get to help around the base anymore. He asks her how she became an assassin and Sheila tells him her backstory revealing that she once murdered her friend's abusive ex-boyfriend in self-defense. At that moment, she felt really calm and didn't panic at all despite being so clumsy normally. A few days later, his friends ambushed her in the streets and told her that they had killed both her parents and now it was her turn to die. But once again, she felt really calm in this life-threatening situation and simply stood up with her knife and killed them all one after another. At that moment, she realized that the screw that was loose in her head normally had granted her exceptional talent to be a killer, and so she became a freelance assassin in the capital, until the Revolutionary Army recruited her. Tatsumi wonders if he is really cut out to be an assassin, but Shiel reassures him that he will be fine as he's a much better cook than her. Just then, Bulat comes out of the river as well with his absolutely shining muscles and Tatsumi wonders if he really will be fine. After that, they go inside the base and the boss gives Tatsumi the imperial relic that they recovered from Zank. Tatsumi puts the Wish.com Shiringen headband on and tries to read Akame's mind. He guesses that she is thinking about having meat for dinner and Akam says he's right but Leon says that he hasn't even activated the weapon yet and Akame is just a meathead. With that, he sits down and tries to use the relic, and this time it works but quickly rejects Tatsumi as his wielder. The boss says that the relic must not be compatible with him and so they will send it to headquarters to study it. Seeing how there are so many kinds of relics, Tatsumi wonders if there is one that can bring back dead to life to revive his friends, but everyone tells him that there is no such relic or else the first emperor who created them would have been still alive. This makes Tatsumi really sad and he goes on to cry his night away like a baby and mommy shields lap by the graves of his friends. The following day, he is assigned to Leon and she takes him to the slums where she grew up. There they are chased by some people who are after Leon who owe them money. During their game of Tom and Jerry, Katsumi gets separated from Leon and gets lost. Just then, a young Imperial police officer named Siryu comes to him and asks if he is lost. Katsumi tells her that he doesn't know the area very well and notices the living Imperial relic alongside the girl. He plays it cool and has her show him out of the place and they both part ways. Tatsumi turns back to report about this to everyone while the girl resolves that she will find the person who killed her mentor, Sir Ogre, and avenge his death. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister decides to send their strongest high-ranking general as Deef to crush the Revolutionary Army after her successful expedition in the North where she buried more than 400,000 men of the enemy forces under ice using her relic. Back in the slums, Tatsumi and Leon continue their mission at night. Fei target this time around is a drug mafia who is kidnapping young girls from the slums by drugging them and then selling them off as slaves. Leon activates her relic and transforms into her catural form and then takes Tatsumi and jumps inside the building. They confirm their target from the roof and then jump inside and start playing Fruit Ninja with the mafia men and complete their mission with a perfect score. In the meantime, Mine and Shield take care of the boss of the drug dealers and start running back to the base. But on their way, they are ambushed by Sirio. Mine starts the battle by shooting her with Pumpkin but Siryu's living relic, Koro jumps forward and stops the attack. Siryu starts shooting at both of them and then orders Koro to go attack Shiel but she cuts the beast's head with her scissors. She starts walking forward but then realizes that Koro is still alive and about to attack her, but Mine saves her by pushing the doggy back with her energy shot. She tells Shiel that living relics have a core and unless you destroy them, they can't be stopped. Just then, Siria tells Koro to become a Jiga Chad by growing muscular arms and then orders him to attack them. Shield stands forward with her relic and uses it as a shield to block the heavy blows from Koro. Siryu uses this chance and blows the whistle to call for backup and things start looking bad for the Night Raid girls. Feeling endangered, Mind blasts Koro back with a powerful shot from Pumpkin and Shield uses this chance to attack Sheryu and pushes her back into the forest. While trying to block her attacks, Siria missteps and falls back and Shiel cuts off both her hands with her scissors. But Sharia reveals two guns built in her elbows and tries to shoot her by surprise but Shiel simply blocks the bullets with her relic and then cuts off her arms as well. Thinking that she can't win otherwise, Siria reveals her trump card and unleashes the dog within Koro and makes him transform into the mad dog everyone told you to not worry about. Koro grabs mine and starts crushing her and Shiel leaves Siria to save her. She manages to cut Koro's arm saving mine but Seryu takes this chance to shoot Shield down with a gun built inside her mouth. And just like that, Koro bites her in half and we lose the first best girl of Night Raid. 
Soon the reinforcements come as well and surround mine, but Sheil uses her last breath to blind them, all using her relic's special ability to help her escape. Back at the base, Mine reports Shield's death and everyone becomes sad with the news. Tatsumi loses his mind and decides to go and avenge her but Bulat punches him down and tells him to calm down for the time being until they devise a plan. Mine resolves to kill Siri with her own two hands and they all call it a day with a successful mission, but sadly at an expensive cost. Meanwhile, Estif returns to the capital and reports to the Prime Minister about her victory. She says that she will now take over the mission to eradicate the Night Raid herself and the King asks her what she will like as a reward for her accomplishments. Surprisingly, she replies that she would like to fall in love and then says that she has a very specific type and she will be noting down her preferences. After that, she sends three members of her unit to kill good officials in the city who are opposing the Prime Minister and then leave behind flyers with the Night Raid's symbol in hopes of framing them for the crimes. The next day, Tatsumi feels down about Shield's death and wonders how it came can be so calm. But at night, he meets her, and she breaks down in tears as well and reveals how she feels heartbroken over the death of her friend, but she must keep her feelings in check so they don't impact her mission. The following day, the boss calls everyone and tells them about the killings of the good officials and about their next mission. She sends Liam to scout the capital and see what his death is up to, and then says that Tatsumi and Bulat and Akame and Lubak will be forming two teams and guarding one of the two good officials that are likely the enemy's next target. And their mission will be to take down the enemy who are framing them for these killings. The next morning, Tatsumi and Bulat board the massive cruise ship to accompany the official they will be guarding while Akame and Lubek stay in the capital to look over their official. Akame wishes for the guys to return safe from their mission as she doesn't want to lose any more friends. Meanwhile, Leon tracks down Estif and realizes that she is a side character and she will most certainly die if she attacked her right now. So she does the smart thing and runs back with her tail between her legs. Back on the cruise, Tatsumi walks aboard the deck watching the official he's supposed to guard and wonders how anyone is going to assassinate them with all these people around. He wonders if he should relax and chill a bit but Bulat punches him from his invisibility and tells him to focus on his mission and be a good bodyguard. Tatsumi notes how useful the invisibility feature of Bulat's armor is. Hearing this, Bulat says that he has been wearing it since his days in the Imperial Army, when he fought his hardest, but in the end it didn't matter because his general was wrongly accused and was taken to royal court just because he wouldn't bribe the Prime Minister. Bulat tries his best to fight back, but the general is taken to the capital and is never heard from again. After that, they framed Bulat as a criminal as well and so he ran away with Incursio and joined the Revolutionary Army to fight against the corrupt government. After his story finishes, Incursor says it's bored too and its invisibility starts to wear off. Bulat says that he will have to take the armor off for a bit and so he leaves the deck to Tatsumi and goes inside to recharge. During lunchtime, everyone suddenly starts hearing a flute playing and this makes everyone fall asleep. Tatsumi thinks that there must be something wrong and he goes out to the deck to see if they are under attack. And rightfully so, the loudest of Estith's three men, Daidara comes out from the dark. He throws a broad sword towards Tatsumi and tells him to face him off in a battle. He says he wants to gain experience so he can be the strongest there is and then takes out his battle axes as well. Tatsumi starts the battle like an idiot as always and goes for a wide jump strike with his sword but Daidara makes him fall back with a strong strike from his axes. After that, he throws one of the axes towards Tatsumi like a draven. Tatsumi tries to dodge it but gets hit by it on its way back. Daidara reveals the name of his imperial relic as Belvark and then throws one of the axes again. Tatsumi thinks he's smart and can pull off a Goku Frieza destructo disc action on him, but Bulat punches him between his suicidal assault and says that it was a new play. Daidara asks who he was and why he isn't affected by the flute music and Bulat says that it was due to the Andrew Tate level masculinity that he has. He notices the wound on his leg and realizes that he's BSing about his masculinity and he just stabbed himself in the leg to break out of the Genjutsu. Bula tells Tatsumi to watch his battle closely and turns around to face him. He shouts in Curcio and equips his armor like Sailor Moon, but just then, all three of his Deeth's men jump on him at once. Tatsumi thinks that he's done for but Bulat instantly hits the two intruders back and splits Daidara in half with his spear like some finishing move right out of Mortal Kombat. Tatsumi realizes that Bulat is actually really super strong and Bulat tells him to take notes and be mindful of his surroundings. Just then, one of the men stands up and starts walking towards Bulat by calling out to him by his name and reveals himself to be General Liver, the guy Bulat served back in his army days and the one who got wrongfully taken to the royal court. After their not-so-touching reunion, they both start fighting and Liver reveals his imperial relic that has the ability to control fluids. He starts the battle by creating several water serpents and attacks Bulat but he faces them head-on and slashes through them with ease. 
In the meantime, Taksumi deals with the flute blower, now and engages him in battle. Liver starts getting serious and attacks Bulat with several water streams while he's mid-air but Bulat comes out victorious anyways and charges down with his spear towards Liver. Now interferes by attacking him but Bulat simply kicks him off aside, putting him back in his place. He then faces Liver once again and just then, Incursio wears off and Bulat notices that Liver can't use his relic either due to overusing it. With things looking even, they both start fighting each other with swords and Bulat manages to cut Liver down but not before he injects some of his poisoned blood into Bulat. Now with two of the men down, only Nao is left behind but Bulat is in bad condition and Tatsumi already lost to him once. Nao uses the hidden ability of his relic and uses its powers to turn into a buffed dude. To give him a chance, Bulat gives Tatsumi the key to Incursio and tells him to take it. After taking the key, Tatsumi fills it with his spirit and Incursio comes out in flesh and adapts itself to adjust to Tatsumi's measurements. After completing his Sailor Moon transformation, Tatsumi and Buff now clash fists and Tatsumi ends up one-shotting him with his newfound power. Once again, they complete their mission successfully and retrieve three new relics from the enemies but at the cost of Bula's life. A few days later, the boss goes away to the headquarters to deliver the relics they secured from their recent missions and to request reinforcement, as they have already lost two strong members in their group. She leaves Akayam in charge and lets her train the others in her absence. Mine also recovers from her injuries and begins her training alongside everyone else. On the other hand, SD forms a six-man unit of relic wielders called Jagers. I'm sure she loved Attack on Titan as much as everyone else. In her new group, there is a country boy named Wave, who serve in the Imperial Navy and looks like Tatsumi 2.0. There's Kurom, who is Akame's younger sister, the crazy girl Seryu, a guy a doctor called Stylish, the totally not creepy dude Bowl, and the dude who thinks he's cool Run. After their introductions, they sit down together with Estif and she says that she is looking to fall in love with someone, and that they are also looking for someone compatible with the scissors relic that they got from Shiel. To find a suitable warrior, they decide to hold a martial arts tournament in the city. Back in the capital, Tatsumi goes to Lubak's shop where they have a secret base in the basement. Tatsumi asks him and Leon about Estif and why everyone fears her, and they tell him about her brutal way of fighting and battle crazed nature. After that, Lubak tells him to enter the tournament to get a closer look at her if he wants, and can also send the money back to his village if he wins. Tatsumi decides to go along with that and enters his name in the event. On the day of the event, he goes on to utterly mop the floor with his opponents and manages to smile big when everyone cheers for him. We find out that Isdif is looking for a strong young man who she can manipulate as well as who has an innocent smile. Somehow Tatsumi fits all these criteria and she falls in love with him at first sight. She jumps down from her booth and walks up to him and tells him that she will reward him personally for winning his fight. Then she puts a collar around his neck and walks off and our boy gets kidnapped by her just like that. Back at the base, everyone decides to think up a plan to somehow rescue Tatsumi and move their base further into the mountains as well. The next night, Isdif takes Tatsumi to one of their missions where she tells him to watch the Jaegers defeat the enemy forces. She says that he will be a backup unit of the Jaegers and she will train him personally. Tatsumi wonders if he can use this chance to bring Isdif to their side, but he feels afraid of her strength at the same time. Later that night in their room, he tries to convince her, but Isdif says that she believes in the survival of the fittest and can't side with the revolutionary army. Tatsumi becomes mad after hearing this and refuses to return her feelings. After that, she binds him down and asks all the members of her unit if anyone had any experience with love. Surprisingly, Bowles has had a wife for six years now, and he tells her that persistence is key, and even he was rejected the first two times. Isdif takes notes and decides to win him over. The next day, Tatsumi makes introductions with the rest of the members of the group and finds out about their backgrounds, including the fact that Kurom is Akame's sister. After that, he is assigned to a hunting mission, and is paired up with his version 2, Wave. On their way, they talk to each other, and Tatsumi realizes that Wave is actually a good guy and thinks that he is fighting for justice by being in the Imperial Army. They both fight some tree treants for a while, and Tatsumi uses this chance to escape with the help of Incursio's invisibility and speed. After dealing with all the danger beasts, Wave realizes that Tatsumi has escaped, and he thinks about peeing his pants, imagining Esdith's angry face. He then decides to use his relic, Grand Chariot, which surprise surprise is actually Incursio 2.0. He then zooms around at fast speed and eventually catches up with Tatsumi while he is wearing Incursio. He thinks that it's actually Bulat or someone else from the Night Raid and starts fighting him head on. Tatsumi decides to run away anyways, but Wave proves to be much stronger and faster in every way, and he even kicks through Incursio's armor with a kick. 
He kicks Tatsumi down into the river, and Tatsumi uses this chance to escape using Incursio's invisibility that he can hold for only a few seconds. Wave thinks he escaped and decides to run ahead and look for him. Meanwhile, Tatsumi gets attacked by a danger beast when he's down, but Akeem saves him, and they all run back to their base alongside Lubuk. Back at the base, Katsumi tells them about the relics and abilities of the Jagers and everything else he found out from his stay there. He says that all of them are as strong as themselves, but Istith is a completely different story. Hearing this, Akeem says that even though she is strong, Istith has a weakness, and that is that he is alive, and as long as she has a beating heart, her relic will be able to defeat her with a single scratch. On the other hand, in the capital, Estith punishes Wave for letting Tatsumi and Kurzio wield her escape and tells him that failure is not an option for him the second time. Siryu also fails to track them down, but Dr. Stylish finds out the Night Raid's base with the help of his Chimera experiments. But instead of reporting about it back to Estith, he decides to take them all out alone with his army of mutated prisoners. They begin the attack with one of the Chimera men taking Leon by surprise and supposedly killing her. By this time, Lubak finds out that they are under attack thanks to his relic and informs everyone else. He is attacked by a bunch of flexible chimeras that are hard to cut with his wire relic, but he manages to strike one down by creating a spear out of his wire and piercing the enemy with it. After that, he is chased down by a bunch of similar enemies, but Akain comes to his rescue and butchers them all into smithereens in an instant. Just then, she is attacked by a mechanoid chimera, whose body is made of iron and so resistant to Murasame's poison. She proceeds to fight with him while Lubak deals with two iron golems. Meanwhile, Tatsumi jumps out of the building equipped with Incursio and starts knocking a bunch of nameless NPCs with his punches. He is then challenged by an Italian man who has shield scissors. Looking at Xtase, Tatsumi becomes furious and he charges forward to kill a guy but he strikes back with the scissors and breaks his arm guard. Tatsumi tries to punch him again but he knocks him back and starts walking forward to deliver the finishing blow. But just then, Mine comes on the scene with her pumpkin and prompts the guy to attack her. She charges up her weapon, letting the man come closer, increasing its power, and then one-shots him to Narnia and retrieves Ixtase back. Dr. Stylish feels bad about losing the Imperial Relic, but just then, they all notice a giant manta ray danger beast fly over them carrying the agenda and two new members of the Night Raid. In the meantime, Akeem and Lubeck finish off their opponents and join the rest of them outside. The Chimera man who attacked Leon tries to sneak attack mine from the bushes, but before he can do anything, Leon one shots him to meet the macho Italian man in Narnia as well. She reveals that she just healed the damage with her relic, and so she was actually fine. After that, all of them gather around and get surrounded by all the remaining Chimeras. They decide to finish them off quickly, but suddenly, they all fall down except for Tatsumi who is wearing Incursio. Dr. Stylish reveals that they released a paralysis poison in the field, and that was taking effect now. Tatsumi thinks about protecting everyone alone, but just then, the boss sends down one of the new recruits to show their strength. The blue-haired guy, Susana, wields his massive bladed weapon and starts killing all the enemies in the area with ease. Dr. Stylish decides to blow the dead men up in hopes of taking Susana down as well, but he simply heals up all of his injuries, revealing that he is actually a humanoid imperial relic himself. Seeing all of his men defeated, Dr. Stylish decides to make a run for it, but Susano catches up with him soon and stops him. The doctor then decides to face off against them and injects himself with a special serum that turns him into a giant titan. Looking at the massive beast, the Night Raid decides to play attack on Titan, and they all start fighting him. Susano blocks his movements while Tatsumi takes a Akame with him to reach the titan's head, where the doctor's real body is. Mai knocks the titan down with her energy shot, and Akame finishes the battle by cutting him and killing the doctor with her poison. After taking care of the enemies, they all meet up with the boss, and she introduces them to the new recruits. They all move up to a place much farther into the mountains, where they will be hard to locate and the introductions begin. First up, it's Chelsea, who is a skilled assassin who has almost as many kills as a cam. She's cute jolly, manages to tame a cam with some sweets and even got a mind's wrong side by making fun of her. On the other hand, Susanna is a handsome buffed dude whose special ability is being a mom. He can cook, clean, do laundry, manage finances, and heck, even build you a house. Everyone starts getting alone besides Lubak, who considers Susano being a manly competition to him despite him being a relic and mine who is just annoyed with Chelsea. Back in the capital, Serio mourns the doctor's death whom she considered her mentor after Ogre and Esdeeth comes to comfort her and makes her devote her life to her. Wave walks alongside Kurum and decides to be a man and cheer Serio like his mama advised him when he was little but he finds himself to be too late when he sees Esdeeth and Serio hugging each other. Back at Night Raid's new base, the boss tells everyone that their last battle for revolution is coming close, and so they will spend the next month training and leveling their skills up. 
After a montage of training in the mountains, they all feel stronger, and Tatsumi becomes able to use Incursio's spear as well. We also find out that Suzano was lying dormant after his last master died, but he decided to follow the boss because she looks similar to his former master and Chelsea's imperial relic is a makeup kit that lets her completely change her shape and size and transform into any other living thing. After their month-long training, Chelsea looks at them all and says that they are good fighters, but much like the dead members, they ain't good enough yet, and they must harden up. This makes Lubak, Tatsumi, and Mai mad as they think she is insulting Bulat and Sheil, and they decide to pull a prank on her during the night. First of all, Lubak and Tatsumi come up with a plan to put a water bucket over her head while she's taking her night bath and then make her feel embarrassed. But in reality, Lubak just wants to see how hard he can push his luck with being a peeping Tom and sends Tatsumi forward with his invisibility quirk. Tatsumi decides to sneak up on her and starts creeping forward with the bucket, but suddenly Suzano comes out of the waters instead of Chelsea, and he tells him that he can sense his presence even though he can't see him. This makes Tatsumi realize his weakness, and he comes out clean and apologizes to Suzano. Suddenly, Suzano turns back into Chelsea, and she reveals that she noticed his presence getting closer, so she decided to pull one back on him with her relic, and then tells him that her last team died in their mission, and she was the only survivor, and that's why she told them to harden up as she don't want to lose anyone else. Hearing this, Tatsumi realizes his mistake and apologizes to her and then leaves but not before she warns him about never peeping on her or else she will cut it. A few days later, a new problem starts arising in the capital. A bunch of humanoid danger beasts start appearing in the forest and the mines and they attack and eat whoever they come across. But things start getting especially bad when they start breaking into houses and eating people alive. At this point, their numbers keep multiplying and it becomes a mess for the capital. The Prime Minister sends Isdif and her squad to capture some of the beasts for his pleasure while the rest of the Imperial Army is ordered to call them down. They complete their mission with ease with the help of the Ice General, and she orders Run to investigate the origins of these new danger beasts and see if they have any link with the disappearance of Dr. Stylish and his human experiments. Meanwhile, the rest of the Jagers await their new orders and talk to each other. Wave feels mad that people judge Bowles due to his looks and that he is actually a really nice guy, but Bowles reveals that he is not a good guy at all as he has burned villages and people alive when given orders even when they begged for mercy and claimed their innocence till their last breath. Just then, his beautiful wife and daughter come in with his lunch and Wave realizes that he really is a loser when compared to Bowles when it comes to romance. After his investigation, Run reports that they were indeed human beings who were turned into danger beasts, and it must be the doing of some imperial relic otherwise, they could be specimens who escaped Dr. Stylish lab. As Deve tells him to look further into the matter and see if they escaped or if they were purposefully let out and if there is a mastermind behind this attack. Back in the forest, Tatsumi continues his training alongside Suzano when Akame comes in to tell him about their new orders. They all head back to the base and the boss tells them about the humanoid danger beasts who are attacking people and have appeared in the forest out of nowhere. This time around, their goal is the same as the Imperial capital, and that is to kill the monsters who are harming people. They will operate at night to avoid any run-ins with the Imperial army and will lay low until the final battle for revolutions. At first, Chelsea is skeptical about this playing the hero and saving people, but Tatsumi convinces her otherwise with some talk no jutsu and looks really cool. While well, that would have been true if his fly wasn't open, and Suzano had told him about this before the whole meeting. During the night, Tatsumi pairs up with Lubak and patrols the mountains for the danger beasts, but they find none. On their way, he asks Lubak why he calls the boss by her name rather than calling her boss, and he reveals that they have known each other since before the Revolutionary Army was formed. He tells him that when he was young, he belonged to a rich family of merchants, so he became bored with the world as he had everything at an early age. Everything seemed boring until Nagenda was assigned to his city and he fell in love with her at first sight. After that, he joined the Imperial Army and rose through ranks to be with her, and when they joined the Revolutionary Army, he did it for love and made his records look as if he had died in action. Hearing his story, Tatsumi tells Lubak to stop being a pervert and peeking at other women, and then goes ahead to the top of the mountain for a final survey of the area. At the summit, he takes a look around and finds no danger beasts so he only quips in Curcio, and decides to go back down but suddenly, Esdi falls down from the sky like a bloodthirsty angel ready to take down the night raid. We find out that she was on a random night patrol and saw someone on the mountain, and thought it was the enemy, but as soon as she comes down and realizes that it's Tatsumi, her expression changes, just then, they are ambushed by a dozen of danger beasts and Tatsui thinks this to be his chance to escape, but Isdith instantly kills all of them and faces him again. She then walks forward and hugs him from behind and tells him that she was on patrol duty and that she was so happy that she ran into him. 
She then asks him what he was doing there and Tatsumi says that he was fighting the danger beasts and has been training himself. Izdiv asks him if he has joined the revolutionary army and he says that not yet but he is not changing his mind about it. She commends him for training and growing so strong and then turns around to call out to the person hiding behind the rocks. Suddenly, a silver-haired hooded guy comes out and he uses his relic, Shamhala, and teleports them both off to a remote island. On the remote island, Tatsumi wonders if it's an illusion and asks Izdith to pinch him and she instead kisses him and says that it's reality as she can feel everything fine. She says that it must be the ability to manipulate space and the guy must be a strong relic user and wonders who he could be. After that, she uses her ice powers to create a massive pillar, and they both try to take a view of their surroundings. They realize that they are in the middle of the sea with only water all around them. Just then, a giant mutant titan comes out of the forest and starts attacking them. Tatsubi notes that it looks similar to how Dr. Stylish looked in his final form and how it took their whole squad to take him down. He wonders how they will manage to defeat it, but Esdith simply showcases her demonic powers and rips the massive titan full of holes with her ice spears. The titan is however still moving but Tatsumi rushes forward and kills it by attacking its main body. Just then, another titan comes out and tries to attack them from behind but Esdith crushes it under a massive ball of ice that she summons out of thin air. Looking at her, Tatsumi realizes just how strong she is and wonders how Akame is going to defeat her. After that, they both rest up and catch their breath and Tatsumi asks her what they will do now. She says that they will roam around the island and study their surroundings to find out where they were and then figure out a way to go back. They spend the rest of the day doing just that and Esdiv enjoys it as a couple's date with Tatsumi. That night, she tries to seduce Tatsumi once again, but he denies her advancements unless she changes her mind about helping the Prime Minister. After that, Esdiv takes him back to their point of spawn on the island and says that it is likely that the relic user could only send them to locations that he has marked with his ability and so he will most likely open this portal again in future, and they can wait for that to happen to go back. Besides that, she can also tame a danger beast and they can ride it back to the capital. After that, she pushes Tatsumi down and tells him that she wants to enjoy her time with him there for a bit more and asks him how he learned the way of the sword. Tatsumi tells her that he is from a village and there was a retired soldier who taught him how to use a sword as well as forging weapons. He wanted to learn a lot of skills so he could make it big in the capital. He then asks her about her past and she reveals that she was the daughter of the chief of a tribe in the north. She grew up in a harsh environment where it was always the survival of the fittest, and that's how her father raised her. One day, the northerners attacked their tribe and killed her father as well, but to her it was just proof that their enemies were stronger and so she must grow stronger as well if she wants to live in this world. After her tribe was killed off, she lived by hunting down danger beasts alone until their numbers started to decrease, and so she moved to the capital and joined the army. For her, it only changed from killing beasts to humans and it didn't matter at all. After that, he asks her about her relic and she says that she wields the blood of a danger beast that allows her complete control over the ice element. And it also enhances her urges to kill others and grow stronger. Hearing her story, Tatsumi realizes that no matter what he can't change her mind and he feels sad and frightened by the thought of facing her as an enemy in the future. Back in the capital, we find out that the silver-haired guy was the son of the prime minister named Sura. He releases his relic and opens the portal back and Tatsumi heads in first to escape from Esdith. Once back, he equips Incursio and turns invisible and hides behind a rock like a chicken until Esdith leaves and thinks that the next time they will meet it will be his enemies. After she leaves, Tatsumi goes back to the base and reports everything he found out about her to the boss and the rest of his friends. We also find out that the boss is in her mid-twenties, if anyone was wondering. They have their meal. And she says that the revolutionary army will be taking their first step towards overthrowing the corrupt government, and they will discuss their strategy after the meal. She starts explaining that there is a religious group called the Path to Peace, which has been gaining a lot of followers recently and has grown quite a bit in the East. This group will soon take up arms against the corrupt government and lead people to fight the Empire's forces. Tatsumi says if they shouldn't stop them as this will surely result in a lot of deaths, but the boss tells him that the people of the nation have had enough and they are ready to sacrifice their lives to make way for a brighter future. She then says that in the past, such forces have tried to fight the Empire as well, such as the Northerners, but the Empire has always been able to defeat them. That's why this time they are going to team up with them and strike the Empire from all sides. At the same time, when the religious insurrection will begin, the Revolutionary Army will launch a full-scale attack from the South, while their allies in the West will invade the Empire, as well resulting in a three-pronged attack. She says that the Empire has stationed most of their forces in the South to combat the Revolutionary Army, but due to corruption and unjust emotions, 
Most of the officers have decided to help overthrow the government and will let the revolutionary army pass through with a bloodless surrender. In all this chaos, the Empire will most likely send in Commander-in-Chief Budo to face the surrendering forces, and that will be their chance to infiltrate the palace and take down Prime Minister Honest. She then says that their mission is to go after the advisor of the founder of Path of Peace. As it turns out, the advisor, Balak, is actually a spy sent in by the Prime Minister to take control of the religious group. He laces the food of his followers with drugs and turns them into his puppets. Their mission is to kill him so the religious insurrection can begin without any issues. Besides that, they are requested by the headquarters to take down Bulls and Kurom of the Jagers as they can prove formidable enemies in this war. So to start things off, they will use the mark on their backs and lure the Jagers out of the capital and then face them in a final battle to get rid of them before the revolution begins. Back in the capital, Run informs Isdif that a cam and mine of the night raid were spotted near the eastern side of the Romary Street. Isdif immediately gives him the order to assemble the Jaegers, and they set out to hunt down their targets. The Revolutionary Army spies see them leaving the capital and send a carrier bird to the boss and inform her about Isdif's leaving with her group. Nagenda decided to go east towards the path to peace while the rest of the night raid went west only revealing a cam and mine who are already on the wanted posters. Isdif catches on to this coincidence and realizes that it must be their plan to lure them out and ambush them. She decides to split her group up in two teams where she, Siryu, and Run will go east after Nagenda and the rest of the Jagers will go west after Akam and Kurom. They go through with this plan and Kurom, Wave, and Bowls head west to face Mine and Akam. On their way, they see a funny-looking scarecrow in the middle of the path and wonder what it was all about. Mine tries to shoot Kurmu down from a distance, but she dodges it at the last moment. Just then, Susano comes out of the Scarecrow and strikes Wave back, sending him flying like Team Rocket. Just then, Magenda comes out alongside the rest of the Night Raid members, revealing that it all went according to their plan and now they had Kurom and Bowles cornered. Akane faces Kurom while Tatsuni Leon and Magenda stand in front of Bowles. Things look good for them, but then Kurom releases her relic, Yatsufusa, which has the ability to summon and command the dead and add anyone she kills with her sword into her army of zombies. The battle starts off as she summons the remains of a giant ultra-class danger beast, Desta Ghoul, alongside seven other zombies of her dead friends. Akam considers this a chance as her reactions would be slower due to controlling eight bodies at once and charges straight towards Kurum. They both start clashing swords, but the zombie of one of their childhood friends makes it a two versus one for Akam, and she is forced back off the Desta Ghoul. Bowles uses this chance to fire her away with his flamethrower relic, but Tatsumi jumps in and saves her in time. He tells her to not lose her cool so they can win as a team. She then orders the Danger Beast to blast through the canyon with its energy breath, and the Night Raid uses this chance to hide into the forest and ambush Kurom again. Mine tries to shoot her down once again, but she is stopped by two zombies, one wielding a spear, and the other two guns. Akam engages in combat with bulls while everyone else fights in a two versus one battle. Susanna tells Magenda that he can take care of the Desta Ghoul, so she should help the others and she goes on to help Leon who is facing the zombie of a former general of the Imperial Army similar to the boss. They both manage to push him back but Kurom takes advantage of this distraction and quickly cuts off one of Leon's arms. Leon uses her beastly strength to stop the bleeding, and then follows the boss's orders to help Akame take down bulls. She goes on to help her fight against bulls and another zombie who used to be a strong bodyguard. Meanwhile, Nagenda fights against the former general and manages to cut off his head. But being a zombie, the body still keeps moving and she becomes really mad looking at the mutilated body of her dead friend. On the other hand, Susano keeps the giant danger beast busy and Nagenda allows him the use of his hidden ability if need be. At the same time, Tatsumi is fighting against a gorilla danger beast zombie alongside another masked zombie. He has a bit of a tough time with both of them targeting him at once, but then he gets some help from Chelsea and he manages to cut the masked zombie in half. After that, he destroys the gorilla danger beast zombie with his punches empowered by Incursio. Mine also takes care of the gunner fighting her, but then she gets captured by the zombie of a frog danger beast. Kurom arrives on the scene and tells her that it's only fitting for her to die in a similar way as her friend Shiel and the frog eats her alongside her relic. Just then, Tatsumi comes up and starts fighting the spearman zombie by Kurom. On the other hand, Suzano activates his hidden ability that lets him drain life force from his master and go into a berserker mode. He uses this power to destroy the ultra-class danger beast in one attack and then takes an agenda to group up with Tatsumi. Mine also blasts her way out through the frog's stomach and they all surround Kurom and the spear puppet. Meanwhile, Akei manages to cut the bodyguard zombie's legs and charges straight for Bulls and Leon uses this distraction to strike him down. 
But she gets shot in her arm by the falling bodyguard, so she simply bites off the relic and bowls his hands with her beast the jaws. They tell him to surrender as he won't be able to use his relic now and Bowles says that yes he can't use it so he will blow them all to Narnia. He throws his relic in the air and then detonates it causing a massive explosion. Tatsumi protects everyone around him by acting as his shield thanks to Incursio and Leon saves Akam by grabbing the bodyguard zombie's shield and bodying the explosion herself. She says that she will be fine thanks to the regenerative ability of her relic, but it will take some time for her to recover. Kurom also manages to escape the explosion and surprisingly, Bulls also makes it out alive and runs into the forest. He thinks about teaming up with Kurom again but on his way he finds a little girl crying by a tree due to a knee injury. He stops by to help her and the girl stabs him with a poison needle and reveals herself to be Chelsea disguising as a child from a village that Bulls once burned. Just then, Lovak also arrives at the scene and tells her that Kurom escaped but he knows her direction. Chelsea says that she will chase after her and finish her off or else she will get more zombies and attack them in future once again. She tells Lovak to go back and send reinforcements while she will go after Kurom the head. Lovak runs back to the base and tells everyone about her and they send Tatsumi and Akain to bring Chelsea back safely. Meanwhile, Chelsea transforms into bulls and meets up with Kurom. She reveals that she had learned the personalities and the way of talking of all the members of Jager thanks to the information that Tatsumi brought and she uses it to completely trick Kurom. While walking together with her, Kurom suddenly falls down and says that her drugged cookies are finished and she needs them right away. Chelsea bends down and pats her back and then stabs her with a poison needle seemingly putting her down. She then takes her sword and starts walking away but to her surprise, Kurom stands back up and reveals that due to the effects of the new drug that he has been taking she's immune to such things and will only die if her heart is stopped or if her head is chopped off. She then swiftly snatches her sword back from Chelsea and unleashes the spearmen and gunner zombies and makes them chase after her. Chelsea uses a smoke bomb and then runs away but she is quickly caught by the spearman who cuts off her arm while the gunner shoots her down at the same time. And that is how we lose our second best girl after Sheila in a brutal way. Back in the city, Tatsumi and Akame are still looking for Chelsea and they follow the blood trail coming from the forest into the city. Tatsumi runs through the streets and eventually ends up in the town square where a bunch of people are crowded around the centerpiece. He looks up to see what they are looking at and immediately falls down on his knees when he realizes that it is nothing other than Chelsea's head raised over a pole. After that, they all return to their base and continue with their mission with heavy hearts and firm resolve to make this revolution happen. We also find out that Leon can reattach her arm thanks to her regenerative properties and Lubbock's wires. The next morning, they all head to the east to deal with the advisor of the religious group so the revolution can start. Meanwhile, as Deef meets up with advisor Balak and tells him that she and the Jagers will act as his bodyguards against the night raid whom they suspect have already infiltrated the east, Balak welcomes them and reveals that he has been protected by the four Rakshasa demons until that point thanks to the prime minister and now they can use them for offense. They decide to send them off into the town to look for night raid members and deal with them. Besides that, Wave notices that Kurum hasn't recovered from her injuries that she got in her previous battle and is pushing herself too much. He confronts her and tells her that he will ask Esdith to let her go for the mission but Kurum reveals that if she is dropped out of the Jaegers she will be killed as she is an assassin of the Empire. She says that she doesn't want that and if she has to die she would rather die fighting like her comrades. During the night Akeem meets up with some spies of the Revolutionary Army to exchange information but they are killed by Abara the four Rakshasa demons. He engages Akeem in battle and showcases his extremely flexible body. At first Akame has some trouble but she eventually manages to cut him in half and comes out victorious. However, she is spotted by Run who thanks her for showing him her relic and then flies off to report back to Esdith. On the other hand, Lubbock is ambushed by Sten and Mez of the four Rakshasa demons out of nowhere. They suspect him to be a member of the night raids due to his coated clothes and scouting nature. Sten manages to punch Lubbock and sends him down and Lubbock uses this chance and acts like he's dead. He uses his wires to stop his heart for a bit to convince them that he was down for the count, so they will leave him be. But unfortunately for him, the demons run into a young girl who is a revolutionary spy and they decide to kill her. Looking at this, the Sanji within Lubbock wakes up and he stands back up and decides to engage them in a battle. He equips his wires and starts fighting the two demons simultaneously. He goes on the offensive by creating a battle axe from his wire, while keeping some to defend him as well. He strikes Stern with the axe, but he simply stops the strike with his bare hands. Stern says that it is useless to contest him like that, but Lubbock says that his goal was to distract them, and they turn around to find out that the young girl managed to escape while they were busy fighting him. With that, Lubbock considers his job done, and he runs away from them. Stern decides to chase after him but finds himself trapped in his wires. 
He is first stopped when he runs into a wire that almost cuts his head off and then Lummox shoots through his chest with a wire spear. After that, he unravels the wires within his body and makes them crush his heart, putting the giant guy down for good. After that, he faces Mez by laying a net of strings around him. Mez uses her secret ninja technique and covers the strings with a slimy liquid that makes them useless. She then kicks Lubak down and walks up to him to finish him off. Lubak throws two knives at her in a last-ditch effort, but she simply sidesteps them and then comes to pick Lubak up and kill him. But just then, the knives come back and hit her in the back and through her heart, and it is revealed that Lubak controlled the knives by attaching his strings to them. And just like that, he manages to escape successfully by defeating two major threats. While everyone is fighting and dealing with enemies, Mine and Tatsumi have good luck for once and they don't run into any enemies. Instead, they end up meeting the leader and founder of the religious group who looks at them fighting with each other and thinks how they both look cute together and starts shipping them instantly. After their scouting mission, they all meet up and decide to continue with their assassination plan on the religious organization's anniversary festival. They split into two teams where Tatsumi and Mine pair up and draw out as many of the night raid members as they can while the rest of the group will infiltrate Bollock's building and assassinate him. Susanov and Leon make full use of their loud strength and barges in from the front door to lure out Kurom and Wave, while Tatsumi and Mine manage to get Siryu and the last demon, Suzuka, to follow them. They lead them to some old ruins outside the city where Seria begins the battle by launching an assault of weapons at them. But Tatsumi takes Mine and runs away with his relic. They are then attacked by Suzuka and Tatsumi engages with her and leads her inside the ruins while Mine prepares to shoot Siryu and take revenge for S.H.I.E.L.D. Seryu takes note of her and launches her most powerful missile at her, but Mine counters it with an energy blast from Pumpkin. Seryu then launches herself forward towards Mine alongside her relic, but Mine shoots the dog down and then starts modding her relic to finish them off. Seryu tells her that she will kill her and feed it to her dog just like she did with Sheil and Chelsea's bodies. This makes Mine really mad and she simply starts unleashing a barrage of energy bullets at them with her modded weapon and manages to damage the dog's core as well. Siri was compelled to use her last resort, which causes her relic to explode, but Mine jumps back in time to dodge the explosion. Siri follows after her and tries to shoot her with the gun inside her mouth. Mine blocks the bullets with her relic, but Siri uses this chance to punch her hard in the guts and sends her back flying. Meanwhile, Tatsumi continues his fight against Suzuka inside the ruins and decides to bury her alive by breaking the walls and pillars of the ancient building. As it crumbles upon them, he zooms out thanks to Incurzio and defeats her for good. On the outside, Seryu walks up to Mine to finish her off and sends her dog after her as well with its last breath. Mine decides that it's not time for her to die and she picks her weapon up and changes it to energy beam setting, and then takes both of them by surprise with an insanely strong energy attack that rips through both her dog and Seryu as well finishing her off for good. As she falls down on the ground about to die, Seryu goes all natural on Mine and detonates the powerful bomb inside her head. Mine tries to get away but finds herself too injured to move out. She curses her fate, but just then, Tatsumi arrives and saves her from the explosion. By the way, breaking news, they both fall in love with each other here. In the meantime, Magenda and the other Night Raid members manage to assassinate Bollock, who disobeys as Dee's orders to stay in his room and tries to escape through the secret tunnel. In the end, this proves to be a big victory for the Revolutionary Army, as well as for Tatsumi. With their mission's success, the rebellion finally starts and the Revolutionary Army starts marching forward towards the capital from the south. As planned, the officers stationed at the forts in between resign one after another without putting up any fight and the revolutionaries continue advancing forward. To counter these advances, the Prime Minister calls for the Commander-in-Chief Budo to speak to his men while he brings out his own son, Sura, and introduces his group of special police called Wild Hunt to take care of Night Raid. Estith is sent to the west to deal with the revolutionary allies while the remaining members of the Jagers are put on standby in the capital. They wonder why they are not being sent on the front lines, but then Kuron falls on the ground and suddenly falls unconscious. As the forces march on, the Night Raid's mission is to infiltrate the palace and put Prime Minister Anis down. Leon and Mine go down the underground sewage tunnels, while Tatsumi and Lubak are chosen to group up with the revolutionary spies inside the palace and infiltrate in advance. They meet up with the daughter of one of the high-ranking tutors of the Empire, and she takes them inside the palace to meet up with the revolutionaries inside. But when they reach the building, no one replies from inside, and Lubeck notices blood coming out from inside. He opens the door, and they all look inside only to find everyone dead there. Suddenly, the dead bodies start to swell up and they explode, blasting the building apart. The girl starts screaming like a maniac, and just then Shira reveals himself from the smoke and surrounds them with his team. He notices that Tatsumi is the same guy he transported to that island with Estith and wonders what's up. 
Tatsubi says that it means he is the one behind the Danger Beast's incident and jumps forward to attack him. But just then, Mudo jumps in from above with his Lightning Imperial Relic. He introduces himself and then starts fighting Tatsumi by hitting him with his heavy lightning-infused punches. Tatsumi equips Incursio and then tries to trade blows with him. Mudo commends him for his skill and hard work, but then knocks him out with a massive lightning strike attack. Meanwhile, Lubuck fights with Shura. Shura showcases his martial arts and teleportation relic and then injects himself with an enhancing drug to boost his power even more. At first, he completely overwhelms him with his infinite teleportation hits, but Lubeck uses this time to set up his wires all over the place. He decides to lure him in, but then the revolutionary girl holds him from behind and calls out to Sura and says that she is doing this, so he will let her parents go. Sura instead strikes her, and says that he had told her not to interfere with his fun, and then turns to Lubeck and says that he is finished. But Lubeck plays the Uno reverse card and cuts Sura's hand, which was holding his relic, and says that he is already under his trap. Things start looking good for him, but the girl gets up and stabs Lubok in the back before she dies and asks Sura to release her parents. Watching this, he starts laughing and says that he had already killed her parents and she is so stupid. He gets his relic back and then teleports Lubok to another dimension. Lubok, however, holds in with his wires and pulls him in with himself. They both fight in there and Lubok strikes him down with his wire spear and crushes his heart just like he did with Sten. He then falls back down from the portal with his stab wound, but unfortunately, Instead of Tatsumi catching him, the Wild Hunt members are waiting for him with their spears held high and Lubuck falls to his death as he gets impaled by them on his way down. Tatsumi cries out his name and then he is captured as well. Back at the palace, Uno informs the Prime Minister about the death of his son and how he took down one of the Night Raid assassins. Anas cries for his son for about half a second and then says whatever and continues with his chicken. Budo then tells him that they took the other one as prisoner and they decide to torture him to death and make an example out of him to deter the other revolutionaries. Just then, Estith arrives in the office and says that she will take care of that matter and in her hearts, says that she won't let anyone have Tatsumi. The next day, they hear that they will have a public execution of him. The following night, Mine decides to go alone and save Tatsumi, but Akame stops her on her way. She tells her to not try to stop her, but Akame says that she is there to help her instead. Just then, Leon comes out from behind as well and says that she will help too, as she is the one who scouted her and tells the boss to not stop them. The boss says that as the Night Raid, it is their duty to stop this execution so it won't lower the morale of the revolutionary army. And so they all set out to save Tatsumi. Back in the Jadal cell, Estif confronts Tatsumi and says that he finally did join the revolutionary army. She tells him to leave them and to come with her and she will forgive all his past crimes but Tatsumi says that he can't be with someone who spreads destruction. She tries to convince him but sees that he is resolute and so says that she will do the execution herself and will see how strong his will to live is. The next day, they all gather in the Colosseum with a massive crowd in the presence of the Kid Emperor and the Prime Minister. Bundo is on security duty while Izdif walks up to Tatsumi with her sword who is strapped to a cross in the center. She points her blade at him and rips his shirt apart and says that she will begin now. But just then, Mine shoots her, making her fall back. She then shoots several energy beams at her making her get away from Tatsumi, and the rest of the night raid flies over the crowd on a manta ray danger beast. She then detonates the explosives that Lubuck had planted in the Colosseum as an advance for the final battle, and makes Izdi fall underground. Mudo shoots them with lightning and Agenda jumps down as well with her relic, Suzano, to face Izdi. Meanwhile, Leon joins Mine and Akame infiltrates the palace to keep the Jagers away from them and kill the Prime Minister. Mine and Leon fight against Budo, but he proves too powerful for them. Leon tries to engage him in close combat to give Mine openings to shoot him down, but Budo paralyzes her with his lightning and tanks Mine shots like a Jiga Chad. Their fight continues for a while, but Budo keeps pushing them back and even manages to strike Mine with his lightning attack by overpowering Pumpkin's energy beam. Meanwhile, Akane manages to enter the Prime Minister's office, but instead of him, she only finds Incursio's key. She retrieves it and runs back to the Colosseum to help the others. With Mine taking a direct hit from Budo, she is nearing her death. With her emotions for Tatsumi and her danger level so high, she calls out to Pumpkin to respond her feelings and shoots at Budo with the most powerful energy beam she can, burning out and breaking Pumpkin in the process as well. Budo responds by shooting lightning at her as well, but Pumpkin's attack overpowers it and shoots through him, putting him down for good. After defeating the Commander-in-Chief, Mine falls down from her platform and Tatsumi just arrives in time with Incursio to catch her. On the other hand, Agenda and Suzano fight against Izdith, but she proves to be too much for them. She fights off Suzano and then freezes him with a single touch. 
Magenda uses the hidden ability and makes Susasin transform, and they gain some equal footing against her. With Tatsumi rescued and Mine in a bad position, Magenda tells everyone to retreat and tries to hold Estith back so they can escape. But Estith is having none of that and she uses her hidden ability that allows her to freeze time. She uses this ability to kill Suzano and destroy his core. Things look bad but then Magenda feeds Suzano more life force, letting him revive as a last-ditch effort. Suzano says that he will hold her back and tells everyone else to escape and starts fighting Estith. They both engage in a fierce battle, while the others escape. Tatsumi runs with Mine in hopes of getting her treatment but Mine says that it's already too late for her and she can't recover fast like Leon. She asks him to put her down and they share a kiss. She tells him thanks for everything and for loving her and then dies in his arms. With that, Magraid loses Suzano and Mine but manages to take back Tatsumi and Incursio and also gets rid of Budo. With this victory, the revolutionaries make their way closer to the capital and Estif is sent to the front lines. Run talks to Wave and Kurom about her condition and says that they escape right now, no one will bother chasing them down but Kurom says that it is not an option for her and she must settle things with her sister. After that, they kill many revolutionaries and Kurom puts in a secret message for Akame to meet her alone in the Kadai forest facility. Akame decides to go alone and respect the wishes of her little sister and Tatsumi tells her to come back alive. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister is Prime Ministering and manipulates the Kid Emperor to use the ultimate relic that requires his authority as the Emperor to be used. That night, Akame walks to the location and meets up with Kurom. They meet up at the old orphanage and reminisce about their childhood. Kurom then says that Akame betrayed her by joining the Revolutionary Army and leaving her behind and then they both start fighting. Kurom activates her relic and calls for the Hurzamis but then coughs up some blood due to her poor health. Akame notices this and decides to finish their fight as soon as possible. They all start clashing swords and Akame manages to still overwhelm them in this 3 vs 1 battle. Back at the palace, Wave asks Run where Kurom could have gone after receiving her note about going to fight Akame and he decides to go save her. Back on the battlefield, the sisters' battle awakens a sleeping experimental danger beast. The beast kills the two strong zombies and then hits Kurom as well but Akame saves her, and then they both butcher it down like the good old days. But after that, they both start fighting once again. Kurom calls out her NPC zombies but Akame reduces them to atoms in an instant and then proceeds to deliver the final strike on her sister. But just then, Wave arrives and pushes her back. He says that he has come there to stop their fight, but then Tatsumi arrives as well and pushes Wave back. He says that for some things the only way forward is for them to settle it themselves and Kurom tells Wave that she wants this as well. She thanks him for coming and says that she would have liked for them to grow closer in different circumstances, and then they both watch the sisters fight to their death. Eventually, Akain comes out on top and stabs through Kurom, putting her to rest once and for all. They hand over the body to Wave and he asks them what it is that they are all fighting for. Akaim says that if he can't answer that question himself then he has no business picking up a weapon and they all leave. Back at the palace, the Prime Minister takes the Emperor to the ultimate Imperial Relic and tells him to activate it. And then it's his duty as the Emperor to protect his people from this rebellion. With the Jager out of their way and the Revolutionary Army in the capital, they all decide to march inside the palace and finally relieve the people of this nation from the tyranny of the Prime Minister. Magenda leads the revolutionaries on the front lines while Tatsumi, Leon, and Akam infiltrate the palace to take Anna's head. Once deep inside the palace, they are confronted by many advanced knights but then Run arrives and says that he will deal with the night raid. Leon decides to fight against him alone and tells Tatsumi and Akam to move forward and finish the job. They ask Run why he is fighting on the Prime Minister's side and he says that he was also under the Empire's oppression, but he wanted to change things from the inside but then they started this whole rebellion thing and he's salty. Leon thinks he's just a kid, and they engage in a cat and bird fight. Inside the courtroom, Tatsumi and Akame barge in and face the Emperor and the Prime Minister. Akame goes for Honest head, but she is blocked by a forced field shielding him. He reveals that the ultimate relic has already been activated, and just then, the whole palace crumbles and from within emerges Mecha Emperor Shikotezer. Totally brainwashed, the Kid Emperor unleashes a laser beam attack which indiscriminately kills a bunch of people alongside demolishing a bunch of houses in the capital as well. Wave watches this disaster from a distance by Kurom's grave as well and decides to go and fight with the revolutionaries. Akam and the rest of the revolutionaries fight against the imperial forces led by Esdef while Tatsui faces off against the Kit Emperor in the giant mech. The Emperor punches him down and Tatsui decides to use the most OP technique in the history of DOTA, Talk no Jutsu. He starts fighting the Emperor and gets brutally beaten down but keeps on talking and telling him how people are suffering 
due to his actions and how he is being manipulated by the Prime Minister. The kid snaps and decides to shut him up by stomping him under his feet, but Wave arrives just in time and saves Tatsumi from becoming Spatsumi. Ron also decides to stop fighting back and focuses on saving the people of the Empire alongside Leon. After that, Tatsumi and Wave fight the mech together and during a fight Tatsumi stumbles upon a weak spot on the mech. He asks for Wave's help and they both manage to do heavy damage to it. Feeling pain, the Emperor shoots them both down with laser beams and knocks Wave out with it. In this harsh moment, Tatsumi remembers Bulat's advice and calls out to Incursio prompting it to evolve with the power of sheer plot armor. Now golden and shiny and newfound wings, Tatsumi dodges all the laser attacks and strikes through the mech with his willpower and manages to rip through it, destroying it in the process. But then he sees the mech falling down over a bunch of people and he rushes in to save them. He holds the mech back like Superman and manages to stop it from falling over them, but in the process he lets out too much blood, and just like that breathes his last as a hero. Akain rushes towards him and cries out to him asking him about the promise to never die. Just then, Steve also arrives and Akama tells her that Tatsumi has died. With Tatsumi down and the Emperor defeated as well, the revolutionary army has almost won but Steve still stands between their freedom. She accepts that the Empire has fallen but says that her hunt continues. She says that Tatsumi died because he was weak and then creates a walled arena around Akama and herself. She says that she will simply march on to the next battlefield and if there is none, she will create one herself. Akeg says that she can't allow such a person to exist in the peaceful world that they have all sacrificed so much to create, and they both engage in the final battle which will decide the fate of this nation. They both start the battle by clashing their swords, and at first Akeg is able to match Estith's sword play, but she proves too strong with her overpowered ice abilities. When things start looking bad, Akeg decides to use her hidden ability as well and she cuts herself with her blade. Murasame's poison courses through her veins and this lets her transform into her demonic state which boosts all their states tremendously. She starts going on the offensive and fights Isdith fiercely and even manages to nick her hand. The poison starts spreading through her arm quickly, but Isdith cuts off her arm and continues fighting Akeem quite literally single-handedly. Their battle continues, but Akeem's demonic powers prove too much for Isdith and she is forced to use her hidden ability that she can only use a single time every day. She stops the time when Akeem is just in front of her and then proceeds to stab through her heart. But just as soon as she does that, she realizes that it's only an after image and wonders where the real Akeem is. Just then, time is restored and Akeem strikes her down from above and says that she was being careful of her hidden ability that killed Suzano. Estith accepts her defeat and then puts up a wall of ice between them and walks towards Tatsui's dead body. She hugs him and says that they will be finally together now and just like that, she perishes away into thin air. With the final battle won and everyone dead like Game of Thrones, it's time for the thing we have all been waiting for. Prime Minister Honest's death. He decides to run away and escape amidst all this ruckus, but Leon is quick to catch on and she confronts him in secret passage. She walks forward to beat the living daylights out of the fat pig, but he reveals his hidden relic, which has the ability to be used one time and destroy any relic it is used on. He destroys Leon's belt and then shoots her down with a pistol. But Leon is having none of that and she punches him on his nose and knocks him down. Hannes shoots her multiple times in her stomach, but Leon takes it all like the wild queen she is and then continues to beat him with her fists and smashes his head in. After that, she goes on to meet Akamin and says goodbye to her, while hiding her wounds. She then goes back to the slums she was born in and sees the happy citizens that have won in this revolution and then dies off in an ally peacefully as she bleeds out from her wounds. After that, they all publicly execute the Kid Emperor and Nagenda is appointed to build up the foundations for this new nation. Akam decides to run to the east to establish better connection with the new nation and bids Nagenda farewell for the time being. And that's how Akam got killed comes to an end.